From Yves Saint Laurent to Goya, our next guest has many influences for his work. Welcome, clothing designer Barry, Robert Barry. Welcome, how are you? Great. So that's quite a range, Yves Saint Laurent to the Spanish painter Goya. Yes. Well, it's um, Yves Saint Laurent just because of, of the just powerful influence he's had in the, in the fashion in the fashion world and, and in mm -hmm. history. Uh, and Goya, just because he's one of the, the painters that kind of inspires me through color and through textiles. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of other painters too, like, uh, you know, Yves Saint Laurent was also influenced by people like Mondrian and, and uh, I just did a, a small group of clothes that were um, based on Francis Bacon's paintings. And uh, so I look at paintings and look at the composition and the, where they use color. Yes. And I kind of try to emulate that and, and kind of place it on a woman's body where it's flattering and it uh, um, hopefully takes notice and the women right. would want to wear it. Now, have you always known that you wanted to be a women's clothing designer? Pretty much. Pretty I much. mean, a native San Franciscan. Yes. Then a stint in the Marine Corps. Yes. Then Academy of Art. Yes. And then having a great designer from LA. It's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a history. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, um, influenced very early, I think, even just by, um, you know, what, looking at Jackie O growing up and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, shows like um, That Girl and Bewitched and Mary Tyler Moore <laughs> and things like that really kind of stuck with me. And I just started sketching at a very early age and kind of sketching things that I thought my mom should wear. You know, The Avengers and, you know, Batman. Any, any, anywhere where there was some kind of hyper You were a, a baby boom influenced clothing designer. Yes, absolutely. Now, the, the little kind of detour into the Marines seems a little strange from getting clothing designs from Bewitched and That Girl. And right. It was, uh, it was kind of a thinking time. It was, I, I look back on it as a time to kind of think about um, kind of what is masculinity and mm -hmm. who am I and how do I fit this kind of um, gay man and what mm -hmm. kind of gay man do I want to be and um, do I want to be a gay man. And, and it just gave me a lot of uh, just time to think about myself. And I came out, you know, really thinking, you know, knowing it, I was okay, and it's okay to be this kind of man, right. to be masculine, and also to want to design women's clothes. Uh -huh. So it kind of was a, was a therapy in a way. So did this therapy start before you got into the Marine Corps or once you were there? Uh, I think it kind of started like in high school and grammar mm -hmm. school and just playing sports and, you know, being trying, trying this on and trying that on and seeing what fit well and right. what made me comfortable. And I mean, I went to military school in high school but didn't go into the academy. And part of it was, I thought, my God, what a homophobic, difficult thing to deal with. How did you deal with that? Were you, were you accepted? Were you tortured? Were you out in the Marines? I wasn't out. Uh -huh. uh, like a lot of people weren't out. Um, much different time than now. Yes, much different time. I mean, so, so happy, you know, that people can serve openly now. It's mm -hmm. like such a kind of a gift. And um, it, it, the Marine Corps is a little bit different because it's kind of a brotherhood, and once you've made it in there, you're a brother. And I don't think it's going to affect anything within the within the Corps itself because once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. Yeah, I heard someone say that to me once. Uh, I was talking to a group of people about being out in the military and don't ask, don't tell, and someone made the comment, oh, I would imagine that the most homophobic group would be the Marines, and this other person who was a former Marine said, no, once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. Right. If you can make it, then you're a Marine and you're respected and right. you're accepted as, as a Marine. Doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. No, and it's like, it's kind of funny because now, you know, with the don't ask, don't tell, it's like, okay, now people can serve openly. Well, it's, it's about serving openly because there's always been gay people in the military, you right. know, always. Right. So it's, it's nothing new. It's just now you can kind of, you can be open if you choose to. Right. Well, now you've talked about some of your other influences. Did the Marines have any influence on your design? Mm, I think probably the discipline <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the way they're so sharp and, and creased and um, just kind of that, that kind of linear kind of um, discipline, I think, right. had, some, had some influence. Right, and I've been looking at some of your sketches and some of the photos of your designs. I mean, beautiful stuff, very classic, but as you say, linear. I mean, they're sharp. Yes, yeah, they're very sharp. They're not big sort of... Poopy. Uh, no. Yeah. What I try to do is I try to design, I try to take away elements and kind of just have line, form, color, and texture in the designs. And I always find that, um, like I strive to design very timeless things. And by that I just mean that if you look at something and you can't really tell when it was designed, it could have been designed in the 60s, the 70s, the 90s, the 2000s. And I feel like that's kind of um, my litmus test for mm -hmm. good design, is you look at something and you just know it's good. You don't necessarily know it's from 
the 80s or is from the 50s or the 40s. Right, so you kind of eschew that idea that this is this season's look, this is next season's look. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of grown to that just from the reaction I've gotten from my clients and from women who've bought my clothes, that they react strongly to things that, uh, that fit well, that are made for kind of a real woman's body, mm -hmm. and that are functional, that you can sit down, you can drive a car, you can you know, dance in and things like that that aren't just made to pose or be kind of static. Well, you raise an interesting point. I mean, because um, some of the designers that I've met and spoke with before, they, they talk about creating one-of-a-kind uh, dresses uh, for their, their female clients, and they're for an opera opening or a ballet opening or a symphony opening. I haven't had someone talk to me about doing a unique dress that someone could drive in. Well, it's, it's the practicality. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, uh, if a woman comes in and, and uh, let's say she's a mother of the groom, and she wants a great coat and a great dress, and she wants to reveal, and she wants a shocking pink, you know, lining to reveal, you know, at the at the dinner. Mm -hmm. um, I ask her what she's, what is she going to be doing? You know, um, is it going to be very active? Is she going to be taking pictures where, indoor, outdoor? You know, and just is she going to be riding in a limo? Is she going to be driving herself? Those mm -hmm. types of things come into play because. You know, if you're in a coat and you can't do this and you're driving. It's not very practical. It's not. And you're not going to be comfortable. And ultimately, I want women to kind of put my clothes on and forget about them. You know, I want them not to forget about them in a way that, you know, don't look at me, but forget about them in, in the way that they're confident. And, like, I know I look good. It fits well. And it's functional and I can move in it. Right. And that's what I, I strive for. Now, you're also that rare thing, a native San Franciscan that is yes. still here. Right. Uh, so do you still have a lot of family here in the yes. Bay Area? Yes. And then you went to San Francisco's Academy of Art University to study design, correct? Yes. And then after that experience, you met someone who became your mentor. Tell me a little bit about that. We were talking about it before, and I found that interesting. Yeah, I, um, I worked at the uh, um, Department of Human Services, and I was a trainer there. And I, I For the city of San Francisco. For the city of San Francisco. And that was on uh, Mission and 8th. And around the corner, there was a gentleman named uh, Miguel Dominguez. And he used to design in the basically the 40s and 50s. Um, and uh, he was kind of looking to pass his knowledge on to someone. And his children weren't very interested in the design business at all. And he had tried apprentices, and he had tried people. And they were just kind of flaky, and they didn't really kind of want to commit. And uh, by happenstance, we happened to be introduced. And I came to a studio, and he said, I'd like to teach you. Would you want to learn? And I said, sure. And he said, the first thing he said was, well, everything they taught you in school is wrong, so I'm going to reteach you everything. I'm going to teach you how to drape on the toile, on the, on mm -hmm. the mannequin itself, and how to measure and, and just how to pattern make from draping. And uh, so I apprenticed with him for about a year. I went there every day after work, and, you know, we, we got to be very good friends and very close, and he kind of uh, taught me the, the, the very basics that I've taken now, you know, forward and, and grown upon. And then he passed away. And, right. and uh and um, but I still have like his mannequin. I still have his rulers. I still have his measuring tapes and yeah. all those things. So it still lives on, you know, through my studio. In our last few moments, talk to me about some of the mistakes you think, without naming designers, unless you want to, that are made by some of the named designers who say, you know, well, wow, this is a so and so design, and this is going to be hot for, you know, fall 2012 or spring 2013. Do you ever see some of those ads and think, God, they just got it wrong, and why? Well, I think that every designer has to find their own niche and what their what their own identity is. But um, I'm not a huge believer in trends, and I'm not a huge believer in, um, in things that scream a designer or a certain season. And there are certain designers that um, have certain pieces that are, you know, very overworked kind of in, within the ad campaigns that they use in the editorials. And, um, and they're very expensive, and uh, I, I believe a lot of women buy them. But the women who buy them um, will wear them for a season, and they're kind of... Um, flagged because if they were in the next season it's very identifiable you know mm -hmm. so so I feel like if you look at something and it and it just looks like quality and perhaps not what the next trend is going to be or because um, an editor of a magazine wants to influence a certain company a certain way mm -hmm. um, I, I don't I just um, I don't know it, it is fashion but from where I come from um, it isn't the most practical thing, and that's a weird thing for a designer to say is practical. Right. But um, so you you would you would consider yourself then a practical designer? In some ways, in some ways, it, just in 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 the to the extent that uh, my clothes can be worn mm -hmm. by real people and they're functional, and uh, you can wear them today and you can wear them ten years from now and they still look just as 
fresh and good. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. We've been speaking with fashion designer Robert Berry. Next up, we're going to talk about the current political landscape with Assistant District Attorney of San Francisco, Rebecca Prozan. We'll be right back.